I would now like to ask Maura Fitzgibbons, Professor of English, Gary Trudeau, Pulitzer Prize winning Doonesbury cartoonist, author and producer, and Ellen Hancock and Ross Morey from the Marist College Board of Trustees to please come forward. Dr. Fitzgibbons will read the citation honoring our speaker and the academic hood will be placed by Ellen Hancock and Ross Morey. Gary Trudeau, for nearly 50 years, you have used your art to inform us, outrage us, and make us laugh with what's been called the most important and most hilarious comic strip of our era. Long before The Daily Show and The Colbert Report, your Doonesbury cartoon showed us that smart comedy can sometimes keep us better informed than the mainstream media. As no less than President Gerald Ford once quipped, there are only three major vehicles to keep us informed as to what is going on in Washington. The electronic media, the print media, and Doonesbury, and not necessarily in that order. Through wonderfully weird characters like BD, Mark Slackmeyer, Zonker, Joni, Uncle Duke, and of course, Mike Doonesbury, you told us the stories of the day, one panel at a time. Watergate and Vietnam, campus protests and communes, the Reagan years and the Gulf War, Iraq and Afghanistan. You sent up Hollywood and the art world, publishing, and of course, politics. You have been a bipartisan foe of political fecklessness, depicting Republican Vice President Dan Quayle as a feather and Democratic President Bill Clinton as a waffle. John Kerry, Donald Trump, Michael Dukakis, and Sarah Palin have all made cameos in your strip, though none by choice. Born as it was in the tumult of your student days at Yale in the 60s, it was perhaps inevitable that your strip would be a platform for your political commentary. This prompted many papers to move Doonesbury from the funny pages to the editorial page, when it wasn't otherwise being banned or censored for speaking honestly about controversial topics. The downside of the move, as you've noted, there are fewer readers on the editorial page. The upside, a Pulitzer Prize for editorial cartooning, the first one ever for a comic strip artist. A valuable lesson for the graduates before us here today lies in the breadth of your creative pursuits. You are, of course, a cartoonist, but you are also a Drama Desk Award-nominated playwright a columnist and essayist for the New York Times, Time Magazine, and others, an Emmy Award-winning television producer, and the creator of Amazon Studios' first streaming-only production, Alpha House. And on a day when we anticipate our students' contributions as engaged citizens, we can draw inspiration from your longtime advocacy on the part of American soldiers, veterans, and their families, work which has been recognized with the Commander's Award for Public Service from the Department of Army, among other honors. Servicemen and women have long figured in your work. So too have roommates. Whether in the battlefields or the Walden College campus of Doonesbury, or the house shared by a group of senators in Alpha House, much of your work looks at a blend of people in close quarters. This echoes the Latin origin of the word satire itself, a medley of writings in which authors express their skeptical views of the world. Good satire uses humor and exaggeration to set forth a critique. The best satire, like yours, unleashes a wide variety of speakers and challenges its audience to sort through their ideas. Whether on the printed page, on screen, or on stage, your work reverberates with a mix of lively and distinctive voices. That's a pretty good description of life here at Marist, too, in our residences, dining hall, and classrooms, and we look forward to hearing what your voice will add to the mix. Finally, your approach to your decades-long career is instructive for our graduates who are just beginning theirs. As recently, what keeps you motivated, you replied, I suppose it's just curiosity. I'm still passionately interested in what my fellow humans are up to. For me, a day spent monitoring the passing parade is a day well spent. Gary Trudeau, in recognition of your accomplishments over many days well spent, and for your embodiment of the principles of Marist College, the Board of Trustees proudly confers upon you the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa.
So by the power invested in me by the Regents of the State of New York and the Board of Trustees of Marist College, I hereby confer upon you the degree Doctorate of Humane Letters with all the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our 2016 commencement speaker, Gary Trudeau. Gary. President Murray, distinguished faculty, parents, friends, and most of all, graduates. I can't tell you what an honor and relief it is to follow a member of the establishment. <laughs> <laughs> when I arrived, Rolling Stones music was playing to a rowdy crowd, and it had all the earmarks of a Trump rally. But my task here today is the opposite. As I understand it, it's to ensure that you are not released into the real world until you've been properly sedated. <laughs> I must warn you, I've never failed at this. But you'll be grateful to learn that my message today is blessedly simple. Henry David Thoreau once exclaimed, about all things, simplify, simplify, simplify. Although many have wondered ever since why he didn't just say simplify. So to simplify, I want to talk to you today about a single habit of mine that I hope you've been developing here, one that your professors would hate for you to lose. It's the habit of seeing, purposeful seeing, seeing what's in plain sight, what's off to the side, and finally, seeing what the world looks like through the eyes of others. It's perhaps not surprising that an artist would want to talk to you about seeing. After all, it's how he gathers information. It's the first step of making art. But if I could do one thing in my life all over again, it's to go back and learn to see as an artist once more. There's so much I missed the first time around. This wasn't always obvious to me. My first year in college, I took a drawing class and contented myself with making pleasant figure, figurative drawings until one day my professor looked at what I was doing and decided he'd seen enough. Yes, yes, he said in exasperation. He knew I could draw. I clearly had some talent, but he, what he wanted to know was if I could see. What I was producing, he said, were charcoal stylings filled with decisions I'd made long before I'd entered the studio. Greatly agitated, he ripped the drawing from my pad and to the great delight of my classmates, tore it into shreds. I should hasten to point out that this was before it was possible to sue a teacher for hurting your feelings. <laughs> a few years later, I abandoned fine art, but the lesson about inquiry, about opening the mind and seeing through fresh eyes every day, was not lost on me. I'm sure each of you has crafted an essay that should have been deleted, or a chemistry project that should have been circling the drain, or a sculpture that should have been returned to its natural state. When your choices are lazy or facile or indifferent, when you squander the gifts at hand, major opportunities are lost forever. Your education here was about taking a look, and then another, and then another, breaking through the walls of complacency, whether they were built on self-deception or prejudice, always challenging the obvious, asking the impertinent question. When you stop looking, or when you see only what you want, as a human being, you become a stenographer. The naturalist Annie Dillard once recalled her early ability to clearly see flying insects. This is not as simple as it may seem. It means you are focusing on air, not on the reflective surfaces that lie beyond. Dillard spent whole summers training herself to do this. She felt that if she were going to inhabit space with other creatures, she owed them the courtesy of a look-see. Of course, you have to be available to see in the first place. All of us start out that way. Young children are all artists with wonderfully egalitarian vision. The great Russian painter Kandinsky was floored by what he called the universal child. Why, he asked, why do preschool children around the world, from Eskimos to Aborigines, why do they all use the same icons, the same vocabulary of basic symbols, and why is there such uniform beauty in their compositions. 
Anyone who has ever been dazzled by the art that decorates first grade homerooms may have wondered what Kandinsky did. How do we non-children recapture the pure art of seeing, unspoiled by personal or cultural agenda? Moreover, how do we get the blinders off once we've put them on, once we've narrowed our focus and chosen a path? If we're looking only to the horizon, what are we missing on either side of the road? A few years ago, a musician on the radio show Prairie Home Companion told a story about a man who went to a doctor. Doc, he said, I got a problem. I think I'm a moth. And the doctor said, I'm just a general practitioner. I think you need to see a psychiatrist. And the man replied, well, I was on my way to see him, but I noticed your light was on. <laughs> well, this is the way that life often works. You're on the way to something else when you find yourself drawn to an unexpected light. Now, maybe that light is just a small flickering flame, but once it has your attention, maybe it roars up to the sky and, like a bonfire. Maybe it lights the way to who you were meant to be and what you were meant to do. Or maybe it doesn't. Maybe it can't bear the weight of your interest. Stars can seem bright in our peripheral vision, but disappear when we try to look at them directly. But it's crazy not to try. The whole reason we have peripheral vision is connected to our survival. Back on the prehistoric savanna, things to one side that were bright or in motion were of great interest, and they still are, or should be. So you have to welcome surprise, revel in wonder, resist the tunnel vision, that seems so necessary for success. But there's more to this seeing. While Marist has encouraged you in countless ways to look through unprejudiced eyes, it has been no less insistent that you keep your eye on prejudice. Indeed, one of the main points of a liberal arts education, through your studies of civilizations and cultures, through their language, literature, history, art, and science, is to help you see how things connect, to create a broad understanding of and an appreciation for the world as people other than you experience it. A few years ago, a sociologist studied the different ways in which very young children solve conflict during games. Boys, she reported, were seen quarreling all the time, and when a particularly acrimonious dispute arose, the final word was, repeat the play, a solution designed to save the game. In contrast, when the players were all young girls, the eruption of disputes tended to end the game. The feelings of the aggrieved parties were far more important than the outcome of the game, an unthinkable reversal of male priorities. We all of us play different styles of games and everything else. If any of you are escaping your youth without having once experienced a sense of being different, of there being something wrong with you, then there is definitely something wrong with you. <laughs> Yet these torments are adaptive they make you more alert to the struggles of others. Again, it's about seeing, the kind of seeing we call empathy. Without empathy, the one thing we know for sure is there can be no justice. And without justice, we will continue to live in a world gone mad with grievance and all the many ills that grievance is father to. Randy Newman, the wisest of satirists, once wrote a song about a man who walks out on his family. Everybody cried the night I left, goes the lyric. Well, almost everybody did. My little boy just hung his head, and I put my arm around his shoulder, and this is what I said. I said, I just want you to hurt like I do. I just want you to hurt like I do. Honest, I do. In the second verse, Newman fantasizes about calling all the people in the world together. I'd talk to the people, and I'd say, it's a rough, rough world, and things don't always go the way we plan. But there's one thing we all have in common, and it's something everyone can understand all over the world. Sing along. I just want you to hurt like I do. Sound familiar? In his chilling offhand way, Newman has stripped the human capacity for evil down to its rawest terms. He is explaining how parents are capable of hitting their children, how husbands are capable of abusing wives, how teenagers can shoot each other in the street without a flicker of remorse, how grievance can metastasize into riots and war, how peoples can brutalize each other for centuries, the endless cycling and recycling of pain. I just want you to hurt like I do. That unreasoning hunger for retribution is a big reason why so much of the world lives in the shadow of fear today. The only thing I fear more than fear itself 
is the moral certainty it seems to engender. In a climate of fear, doubt can be unwelcome, and faith can harden into fanaticism, and leaders can come to view themselves as instruments of God's will. And yet, it has always been doubt, not certainty, the constant questioning and testing of cherished assumptions that has moved us closer to a humane and just world. To stop seeing, to stop looking for a better way, to stop trying to experience the world as others do, so as to bind them closer, is to give up on the idea of a better world. In closing, let me just leave you in the hands of Annie Dillard, whom I mentioned earlier. This is how she summarized her adventures in seeing. There are lots of things to see, she wrote, unwrapped gifts and free surprises. The world is fairly studded and strewn with pennies cast broadside from a generous hand. If you cultivate a healthy poverty and simplicity so that finding a penny will literally make your day, then you have with your poverty bought a lifetime of days. It is that simple. What you see is what you get. Thank you and best of luck. Thank you.